This film is the story of several young people. Although not all of them were born and raised in Israel, they are all part of its first generation. The story of their achievements is the story of the State of Israel. Micha Michaeli was born in Israel in 1948. He studied computer engineering and electronics at the Technion in Haifa. Today, he serves as production manager in the Cytex plant in Herzliya and heads a team responsible for the development of the world's most advanced graphic design system. This system is at least 10 years more advanced than similar systems currently being developed in Japan, West Germany, and even the United States. Due to its lack of resources and small population, Israel has been obliged to invest major efforts in the development of sophisticated technologies. Great advancements have been made. Cytex's Response 300 system combines four sophisticated technologies, electronics, lasers, computers, and electro-optics. Why haven't countries which are more industrially developed succeeded in developing such a system? Until today, uh, pages are being designed by using uh, scissors and uh, rubber cement. The other vector is pasting together all the components of the page and place them and also shows different alternative for his uh, page uh, design. We are doing it uh, the same thing on our uh, color monitor where we can see the picture in real color and we can also see the text as it's going to be printed on the paper in real uh, size and color. From the moment the decision is made to go ahead with the system's production, planning and execution begin. It takes at least two years until the product can be marketed. In Cytex, almost the entire production line for the system's necessary components is manufactured in-house. The plant, which employs over 600 workers, is considered to be one of Israel's most modern facilities. Even at the most preliminary stages, before the system can be officially marketed, contact is made with clients who have contracted to purchase and test it. This allows for improvements to be added. Let's have a look at the system in action. Let's see how an art director is designing a page on uh, the Vista system. First, he calls to a page. He's going to position a window for the first, first picture on the left end uh, page. Now, he calls for the picture. He can magnify it and position it carefully in its proper position. The same way we'll position another picture and we decided to bring the wing of Colombia on the top of the first picture and position it carefully in its proper position. text, we'll call the text from our library. Now the computer is copy fitting the text to its designated area. Once the other will finish to design the page, we can produce a hard copy black and white proof on a laser printer, which is exactly the copy of what we have designed on the system. The pre-press system, the most sophisticated of its kind in the world, offers three different functions for the convenience of the graphic editor. It can insert or delete objects or people according to need, and even change the color tones of the picture. After we finish uh, to make all the color corrections and uh, to retouch all the pictures involved in the page, 
we mounting on the drum of this uh, plotter a piece of uh, film. In the back, we have a laser beam that can expose uh, that film according to the data we, of the page that we produce. As a result, after we process the film, we get all the four separations on that film. Using the separations, uh, we uh, produce the offset plate, which are being used later on to print the page. In the past year alone, Cytex's sales have topped the $50 million mark. The Response 300 system has been sold to some of the world's top magazine publishers, including Time Life Incorporated. But the system isn't limited to design for newspapers and magazines alone. Any field or product requiring high-quality color and design can be enhanced by this system. For example, calendars, posters, advertisements, art books, and landscape and sport photography. Micha's demanding job requires him to spend most of his day at the plant. But Cytex is responsive to the workers' needs and tries to provide for optimal working conditions and social benefits. Here in Cytex, we have a club that is being used by the employees and their families for uh, after-duty uh, activities like uh, playing Atari games, computerized games. Uh, we have also a computer course teaching the children how to use uh, personal computers and to program them. If I'll compare uh, the way that I was educated as a child to the way my children are being educated, they are much more exposed to science and to new, new technology. Uh, I heard about computer when I was in college and uh, my 10-year-old uh, uh, son uh, is already uh, pushing and pressing me to buy him uh, a personal computer. I think that we educated the children right now uh, to cope better with new technology and uh, science uh, and I think that the, we, we are raising a better uh, generation of uh, new scientists. Uh, when I first came here I, was, I had the intention of working in a hotel because I had worked in a hotel in the States. But I've decided after being here for a while and, you know, exploring my options here, I've decided to go to Kibbutz. Are you planning on staying there the rest of your life? It's a young country, so I think there's a lot of opportunities available for people here. People here care. Well, it's true. Jeff Ginsburg was born 35 years ago in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the United States. He received his Ph.D. in modern military history from the University of Wisconsin. Six months ago, Jeff immigrated to Israel. Today, he resides at the Kfar Saba Absorption Center. In the summer of 1981, I came to Jerusalem and I participated in a seminar on the teaching of the Holocaust. It was the first time that I'd ever sat down and concentrated, studied in a concentrated way the Holocaust, to me, to be a Jew living in Israel is the answer to Auschwitz. So I came here. And I live here in Merkaz Aklita. It's a pleasant place as these things go, but it's not the style of life to which I was accustomed. It's a small sacrifice. I've never regretted it. Adjusting to a new society is not an easy task to undertake. All of these people left the countries of their birth. Some even left their families behind. One of the most difficult obstacles is the language barrier. For me in particular, it was difficult to come to Israel and to find myself in the situation of a six-year-old child, literally illiterate. But after half a year here, the situation is completely different. And as far as I'm concerned, now uh, the kind of problem I had when I came isn't a problem anymore. And I still have difficulty with Hebrew in its professional applications. But uh, as far as getting along on a day-by-day -day basis, I think the Ulpan is terrific. The Ulpan is a fascinating place to live. There are people here literally from all over the world. Uh, I have a roommate who is from Persia, 
There are people here from Lebanon, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, the United States, and of course a large number from South America. All of them from different backgrounds. All of them with different purposes in being here. Living together, learning to speak Hebrew together. It's a miniature version of how the state of Israel was built. As a lecturer in the Military Academy in Lexington, Virginia, Jeff left behind him a life replete with material conveniences. After 15 years in a luxurious high-rise, life in a tiny room, dormitory style, was not easy. The academic situation in Israel is of fundamental importance to me. It's my profession. Uh, I'm a military historian, and obviously this is a country where war is a very important subject. The opportunity to learn about the military history of Israel is excellent. Not only about the recent military history, but for me, more importantly, the ancient military history. To live within seeing distance of what actually happened. For me, this is very important. This puts me much more closely in touch with the realities that, that uh, Tanakh, that the Bible describes. Today, we have peace with Egypt. Now we have peace with the Lebanon. One threat only, a serious threat, but one threat only. And we have the means in hand to deal with that threat. The Jewish people is more powerful today, in my opinion, than it's ever been in 4,000 years of its history. Clara is my fiance. We met here at the Mercado Clita, the absorption center. She is from Chile. I am from the United States. The language we speak is Hebrew. We have no other language in common. She speaks some English, but I speak no Spanish. So that's how we get along. We hope to find work, and as soon as we find work, and I hope to find work soon, we will establish a household, set up living, and I hope become Israeli citizens, just like any other. Evenings in the Absorption Center are dedicated to activities whose aims are to introduce the new immigrants to the Israeli cultural scene and lifestyle. Lecturers, musicians, entertainers, and other guests are frequent visitors. Tonight, the new immigrants are learning the words of Israel's most popular folk songs. This will undoubtedly increase their involvement in Israeli society and ease the absorption process. Esther Shachamorov Roth was born in Tel Aviv 32 years ago. From an early age, she took part in various athletic activities. Within a few years, she reached the top and became Israel's number one athlete. She timed 12.93 seconds in the women's 100 meter hurdles, placing her among the world's six leading women contenders in track and field. I started getting involved in sports at school. You can see results immediately with a measuring tape and a stopper. You immediately stand out from the others in your class. My physical education teacher recommended that I continue in sports. After I finished public school, I began to train seriously. I started training twice a week and taking part in competitions. My trainer, Amitzul Shapiro, entered me in every competition, each time in a different field. I was only 14 and a half. He didn't know in which field to place me. Esther won every possible championship in the 100 meter hurdles. When she was only 17, she's chosen to represent Israel in the 1970 Asian Games held in Bangkok, Thailand. It was in Bangkok in 1970. I was anonymous then, and I even surprised myself when I took two gold medals. It was the first big international competition which gave me confidence. For two years, I trained for the Munich Olympics. Representing Israel was a wonderful feeling. I trained very hard, and I arrived there with a great feeling. There was an Olympic atmosphere, and everything was new. In general, being in an Olympic village is a very exciting thing. You see different people, different colors, 
great athletes, less great ones, fat ones, skinny ones. It's a real experience for everyone, and especially for an athlete. In Munich, I took part in two preliminaries, the 100-meter run and the 100-meter hurdles. I reached the semifinals in both. But, as all of Israel was anxiously awaiting Esther's performance, tragedy struck. Armed Arab terrorists infiltrated into the Israeli living quarters in the Olympic Village. They opened fire, murdering 11 of Israel's best athletes. Esther's coach, Amitzor Shapiro, was murdered in cold blood. Traumatized by the event, Esther decided to end her running career. But her fiancé, Peter, and her many friends convinced her to carry on. I started running with Esther out of some impulse which wasn't clear to me. Maybe to keep her from quitting track. We were just about to get married. Slowly, I became her trainer because she found it hard to establish contact with another trainer. And after a short time, our baby was born. Afterwards, I began training Esther seriously. And since she missed one Olympic, we decided to train hard and to dedicate all we had to the next Olympics. A situation was created where a husband, wife, and a baby were all set on one goal to achieve the best results in the Montreal Olympics. After two years of intensive training, Esther successfully passed the preliminaries in the women's 100-meter hurdles. This was the first time that an Israeli athlete had reached an Olympic final. It was a difficult struggle, competing against the world's finest sportswomen. Esther gave it all she had. She finished sixth, bringing Israel its greatest achievement ever in the history of athletics. Today, Esther teaches physical education in a junior high school in Kfar Saba. When I work with kids, I feel their first steps. You don't take an adult and train him. If you want to find talent, this is the right age to look for it. Basically, I see one main purpose in physical education, health. I try to guide my pupils so they will take good care of their bodies, learn correct posture, and be health conscious when they grow up. Maybe here, among her students, she'll find a promising young star to take over where she left off. Israeli agricultural achievements are renowned throughout the world. Since the establishment of the State of Israel 35 years ago, Israeli agriculture has made great progress in spite of Israel's limited arable land, dry climate, and small population. Israeli produce nets high prices on the European and American markets, competing favorably with more agriculturally developed countries. Gilat is a regional experimental station belonging to the Agricultural Research Organization, the Vulcani Center, which is the scientific branch of the Ministry of Agriculture of the State of Israel. This experimental station was established 30 years ago in order to check the possibilities for agriculture in this desert area. Avi Nachmias is a first-generation Israeli, born in Tel Aviv in 1948. He studied botany in the Department of Biological Sciences at Tel Aviv University. Today, he is a researcher specializing in the field of plant pathology. Until recently, he served as director of the Gilat Experimental Station. Here in his small laboratory, Avi has been engaged in extensive research over a period of years. He is trying to find ways to combat diseases afflicting fruits and vegetables grown under desert conditions. The goal of this research is to turn this previously barren part of the country into a rich agricultural region capable of providing work for its inhabitants 
and supplying a high yield of quality produce. Here in the lab, we isolate the pathogen from the infected plant. The pathogen is grown on a liquid medium, and from this liquid medium, we isolate the toxin which produce the disease symptom in the field. A plant which will be resistant to the toxin which be, uh, will be also resistant to the disease in the field. We here re-isolate the pathogen on a fresh medium and in sterile conditions. Then we inoculate the liquid culture in order to produce the toxin for the selection procedures of the new varieties. After the lab experiments, we choose the best line and plant it here in a field experiment. So we have here over 1,000 different new varieties. The best varieties from these field experiments will go straight to commercial growing in the kibbutzim in this area. Who would believe that uh, 15 years ago in uh, such a sandy soil with uh, 240 millimeter of rainfall, potato can grow. But uh, this is fact. Uh, we are short in manpower and uh, in order to cultivate this area, uh, we have to use trained people and sophisticated machines in order to get these high yields. So this, uh, this 150 50 hectares uh, is handled by only two people. But not only potatoes grow in the Negev. Thanks to Avi and other researchers like him, Israeli agriculture has made great strides in cultivating assorted varieties of fruits and vegetables under harsh desert conditions. Frequently, scientists from abroad visit the experimental station with the aim of applying the Israeli success formula in their respective countries. State-of-the-art computerized irrigation systems have been developed by scientists in cooperation with industrial enterprise. Hydrometers and other meteorological equipment come to the aid of the farmers in conserving and maximizing the scarce water supply in this area. Thus, Israel succeeds not only in supplying its own agricultural needs, but in exporting out-of-season produce to Europe in the winter months. This brings Israel much-needed export dollars at a time when European agriculture is hibernating. Working in agricultural sciences in Gilat Experimental Station, together with living in Moshav Maslul here, working after duty in uh, my private farm, is going very well together. It was a old dream all of our lives to move up from the city, from the pollution, and to live in, a, in the country. It is a wonderful place to live, to grow children, open a space for the children mainly, clean air, and a place with a lot of friends and good life. In the past, after graduating from art schools, Israel's young artists encountered great difficulties finding studio space. Today, in a small industrial district on the outskirts of Jerusalem, studio space has been made available to promising avant-garde artists, painters, sculptors, and dancers. Studio rentals are subsidized by the Jerusalem Foundation, which screens and selects promising Israeli talents and gives them what may be an important step towards world recognition, a place to work, create, and produce. I, about four months ago, received a uh, studio from the Jerusalem Foundation. I find uh, now, with the space that I have, uh, that I'm just able to work in a very, very different way. I'm a lot more productive. This is part of uh, a series I've been working on for the last two years, and I think it shows very well this impact of, of Jerusalem and Israel on my work. 
it's part of a series of self-portraits where it's kind of preoccupation of myself and the kind of uh, place that Jerusalem is to live. Jonah Fisher, curator of the Israel Museum, is the moving force behind the Young Artists Project. And finally we were able to open those studios about a year ago. And I think that the result is absolutely uh, amazing, uh, wonderful, because first of all there is a wonderful climate, uh, the atmosphere, the work is, is, is really great, and the contacts between the artists is great. And I think that even on the uh, simple, uh, uh, the result, I mean, on the level of the art, artwork is really tremendous. The result is sometimes even amusing, as in the enchanting cut out and painted sculptures by this artist. Using cardboard, wood and metal, David Gerstein creates almost toy-like structures that can be put together and taken apart according to whim. in notation dance group. We are working together for about 10 years now. Uh, all of us are teachers, movement teachers, dance teachers, and uh, what we are trying to do is to, um, to explore the possibilities that the movement notation open to us means that we are not uh, doing any stylistic things, but trying to see and to dig into the material, means the human body potentials. In this concrete block environment, we are witnessing an exciting explosion of Israeli creativity. I think that uh, Almost until last summer, nobody realized that there were so many people painting. And uh, it was almost as if when the trees got a few leaves on them, then the painters started coming in <laughs> for spring, too. And we had a few exhibitions, and we started to talk to each other, and we found that we were, there were painters here painting. And uh, many of them, many more than we knew. and. Uh, now there's a, a dialogue, people are starting to be together. Putting everybody under one roof uh, gave us the opportunity to have a coffee together, to look at each other's work, give each other a criticism and a support, because the support was so lacking before, and it's really beginning to, to bubble now. It's got a pulse. It's got an Israeli pulse. It's got the anxiety. It's got the tension and probably the pain that there is around us. But it also has a great connection to what's going on outside. And that's what we found refreshing to see when we were together. To the world outside, it's just another industrial park. But in some of its concrete block factory space is a group of artists building their vision of tomorrow. One, two, three, four. Simcha Abramson was born 35 years ago in New York City. Today, he serves as rabbi in the Diaspora Yeshiva on Mount Zion, Jerusalem. He plays clarinet and saxophone in the Yeshiva's unique rock jazz band.
I was born in the United States uh, to a not particularly uh, religious family, a Reformed Jewish family. And I grew up in a normal uh, American, not particularly Jewish environment that was involved in all the regular American things, sports, going to dances, all this type of stuff that they do. After high school, I came to Israel to uh, study at the university. And in addition to my learning, when I got here, I felt something very special, which I couldn't identify. I went back to the States after that year. I still had this desire to come back to Israel. I had this feeling. When I got back, I realized that Maybe what I was missing, what I was feeling inside, was uh, something more Jewish, something more traditional. And I decided to come to uh, the Diaspora Yeshiva. And I found that uh, this is what I'd been looking for. The Diaspora Yeshiva is a very uh, unique place uh, in many ways. And the reason is because Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, is a gathering place for the Diaspora. The second half of the name. If you look around this room, you can uh, see these plaques on the walls. What are these plaques? These are in memory of Jews that uh, died in the Holocaust. We don't see it as a as a coincidence that we've established the yeshiva right here on Mount Zion, because we always know from the ashes, from the remnant of the pre of the preceding generations, we'll build up new. The diaspora yeshiva has set as its major goal bringing secular Jews closer to Judaism and its spiritual heritage. Upon completing his studies in the yeshiva, Simcha chose to serve the community as a teacher. He dedicates his time and energy to teaching Torah and Bible to beginners who are taking their first steps in the world of Judaism. You won't find any classes in the yeshiva where people will sit and list facts. We try to get people to participate, to be involved. We try to make things alive, we try to make people feel things, it means use your imagination. For me it's something that's very important uh, to be involved with something like this. Why? Because it, uh, I'm also on the receiving end, where it says, uh, uh, it says in the Gemara and the Talmud that uh, I learned a lot from my rabbis, a lot from my friends, and I learned the most from my students. When you start to think about uh, how you want your children to grow up, what kind of education, you have to think, uh, first of all, about uh, you know, what framework you're dealing in. And we have the chance now to give our children, and to give all of, uh, to give all of us really, a real Jewish environmental uh, education. We're able to now talk about Jerusalem, about Ahavat Eretz Israel, about the love of Eretz Israel, about Am Israel, and really show it to, to really concretize it, to show it in a concrete, uh, in a real way. And as a result of that, I can teach my children about Jerusalem and walk with them through, through Jerusalem. I can teach them about about the temple in Jerusalem, about different places, about different things. I can teach them about the, all the different aspects of, of our history and our culture. And here we are, right here. The function of the family, of the Jewish family, I think, is just like a chain. Each link is connected to the next link, so the first one is connected to the last. This chain is an unbroken tradition coming down from Moses right down to this very day, and I transfer it over to my son, and he'll in turn give it over to his son. And the thing that's really kept us going is this tradition, not just to go to, to school and learn, a subject matter after subject matter, one subject after another, which is also very important. But to understand the values, the Jewish values, and this is what we're trying to uh, teach our children. This is really what uh, what I'm trying to do myself here in Israel. Mm -hmm.